Ministry, Ernest T. Dixon Lecture. And I guess I should add, it's our 15th annual lecture. So it's been a long time, um, uh, 15 years ago, uh, and we're still going, going strong. So that says a lot for, for what we do. Uh, Bishop Ernest T. Dixon, uh, the lecture is named after Bishop Ernest, Ernest T. Dixon. Uh, he uh, was the first African-American bishop of uh, the United Methodist Church in the Southwest Texas Conference, now Rio Texas Conference. Bishop Dixon also was a graduate of Houston Tilton Uni University who came back to serve on the board and chaired the board of trustees. So a uh, phenomenal person. I had the privilege and the honor as I began to pastor. Uh, my first church was under Bishop Dixon, uh, a phenomenal person and uh, he was a blessing to, to know. Uh, and so we wanna keep it moving uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's our, our generally a lecture. Today, it's the Ernest E. Dixon Lecture, A Conversation. Uh, because of COVID-19, we wanted to try to do something a little different. Uh, thought listening to one person the entire time would be a challenge. So uh, thought that a conversation between two dynamic people uh, would make it much more interesting. Uh, so without further ado, I want to introduce two students who work with Religious Life and Campus Ministry, who will in turn introduce our speakers uh, for the day or our presenters for today. So I want to give to you now, Ms. Sonia Nathan and Ms. Surrender Lockridge, uh, Religious Life Campus Ministry uh, student staff persons. Well, hello, everyone. I'm so glad to have you all here. And once again, welcome. Uh, my name is Sonia Lathan. I'm an adult degree program student um, here at the Houston Tillerson University. I am a senior and pursuing my business administration degree. And I do have the honors of giving you some instructions and also introducing our first speaker. Um, one of the things that you can do, if you do have any questions, you can put them there in the chat. Uh, make sure that uh, during, when everyone else is talking that you do mute. Uh, and then once, uh, if you do have a question or if you're called upon and you have to unmute, make sure once we're done with that, that you mute again. But make sure that right now everyone is muted. But if you do have any questions at all, please make sure that you put them in the chat. If we're able to you know, answer the questions at that moment, they will. If not, then they'll be tabled and we'll get back with them. All righty, so I'm gonna go ahead and get to introducing um, our very first speaker as it's listed here um, from the flyer that you should have seen. Uh, Reverend Bridget Green, and I think I did hear that it's soon to be uh, Dr. Reverend Bridget Green, uh, professor of New Testament studies at Austin Presbyterian Seminary and doctoral candidate for, at Van Vanderbilt University. And uh, Dr. Andrea Holman are our guests. Now, um, Dr. Andrea Holman serves as an associate professor of uh, psychology at Houston Tillerson University, where she was recently hailed as faculty of the year for the 2019-2020 academic year. Dr. Andrea Holman uh, primarily engages students in the classroom and conducts research understanding psychological experience of African Americans, specifically the complexities of racial identity and cultural mistrust and their impact on interracial interactions. She has contributed to articles, including publications in the Counseling Psychologist and Harvard Business Review. Now, next up, we do have our own Surrender Lockridge. Hello, everyone. My name is Surrender Lockridge. I am a junior at Houston Tillerson University. I do major in special education. I am glad um, to see everyone. I'm glad um, the two beautiful speakers are here. And today I am going to um, introduce Reverend Bridget Green, Professor of New Testament Studies at Austin, I'm sorry, Presterian Seminary and doctoral candidate at Vanderbilt University and Dr. Andrea Holman, Associate Professor of Psychology at Houston Tillerson University, will engage in a providing discussion of the current national events impacting the lives of African Americans. These include, but are not limited to, the COVID-19 pandemic, the Black Lives Matter movement, 
unjust killing of Black Americans and the state of American economy. The professors will discuss the impact of these events on the spiritual and psychological state of the African American community. This conversation will provide a summer realization of the toll these stressful events may take on individuals, as well as ways cultural norms can exaggerate this toll. Additionally, Dr. Holman and Reverend Green will discuss how the fields of religion, spiritually, and psychology can provide tangible ways to navigate these crises in healthy and ad ad adaptive ways. <laughs> All right. And lastly, just to give you a bit about the biography for Reverend uh, uh, Bridget A. Green, she is an instructor, as uh, Surrender said, in his Presbyterian uh, Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary, where she teaches Bible interpretations and exegesis. If I said that wrong, you all can correct me. Uh, while teaching, she is completing her dissertation at Vanderbilt University. Her dissertation is titled Luke 18, 1 through 30, Social Relationships and the Kingdom of God, where she examines God's call for justice through the transformation of socio-political uh, relationships as both response to and result of participating in God's kingdom. And next, you will hear from our speakers in the next segment. Thank you all so much. Thank you. We appreciate that warm introduction. We are excited to be here and talk about something that has a personal and professional meaning and impact. Um, so Reverend Green, let's, let's just start talking about some things. You know, um, we, we titled this talk, The State of Our Union, right? Um, and we wanted to focus on some of the things that have been impacting uh, Americans, but mainly we want to focus in on the Black American community and experience. Um, what's been going on? So in the last year, right, January 2020, um, Reverend Brewington had, uh, I think it's Michael McCormick come in talking about Queen and Slim. Anything notable happened in the last year that you can think of? <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe... Right now, I've been stuck at home day in and day out working um, mostly and not really getting out. Um, there's a little thing I think called a pandemic. COVID-19 is what they're, what they're calling yeah. that that's happened. Sure. Um, and then this summer, um, in the midst of the amount of police violence that we have seen against black and brown bodies, we had the recording of an eight minute and 46 murder of George Floyd, um, which took the nation by storm. For many of us, we recognize that, uh, unfortunately, these events have happened in the Black community for as long as we have been placed in this country. Uh, but for so many of Americans, um, it was maybe a reintroduction or a reminder um, of what's going on. Um, and then since they have been sitting at home watching television throughout that time, um, it had activated uh, communities of folks who may not have ordinarily felt like they had the time or were as in tune with what's going on. And uh, we saw uh, protests uh, of justice uh, throughout this. And um, just to name a couple of small things that might just have taken small place. Small things. There in, were bushfires in, in Australia, bombings in other places. Uh, I'm going to just list for you just a few of the names of the lives that were lost that we know of in the last year. Um, Alex Trebek, Joe Clark, Natalie Desel reed Johnny Nash, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, Tutibit, Tommy Lister, Kobe Bryant, Gigi Bryant, Chadwick mm -hmm. Boseman, Bill Withers, Little Richard. That all happened in the last year, okay? Um, those are just the people that folks know on magazines and newspaper articles and social media feeds the amount of black and brown bodies that have been lost in general um, just because of life and the fact that it's a terminal disease um, has happened in the last year, um, not even to mention those above and beyond due specifically to the COVID-19 pandemic. So mm -hmm. when the individual sits back and looks what has gone on in the last year, it's a whole lot, a whole lot of, right? It's too <laughs> much sometimes to feel, you know, um, and to really process it. One thing that I've said to um, friends, colleagues, students, and I've said this since March of last year, 
this particular pandemic as it as the experiences in America has not created very many problems. Uh-huh. It's exposed and revealed a lot of problems that were already there simmering under the surface and now they've blown up in our face like a jack in the box. Um, and we have COVID-19 to thank for that. What are some of the issues that you see that have been exposed or, or unveiled kind of the, the rug pulled out um, particularly for black and brown communities as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic? The one that um, comes to me just most quickly for a number of reasons is the disparity in terms of access to health care, sure. as well mm-hmm. as um, understanding the ways in which um, racism and economic injustice and so on and so forth has um, exasperated what people are calling comorbidities. Um, and the way- What's that mean? That's a big fancy That fancy is word. a big fancy big word. Fancy dissertation word, just comorbidity. Comorbidities in the sense of illnesses that are usually um, related to other causes of death, like heart disease and heart attacks, um, diabetes and strokes, um, just to name a couple, them in and of themselves, Um, are aspects of health in in many of our our black and brown communities that we have to pay attention to and watch closely, um, be careful about. And then you're at a pandemic on top of it, adding a virus Mm -hmm. that um, not at the beginning, the sense was it only attacked um, our respiratory uh, systems. But Mm -hmm. what they have come to understand is that it's a multi-organ Um, attack on the Mm -hmm. systems. And so it basically adds exponentially in terms of the exposure um, of one critical illness, let alone critical illness that leads to death. I don't know about you, but I've had um, church members um, that I grew up with um, who have passed away. Um, I have friends who I know um, have certain Um, health issues who have contracted it and have been really, really scared. Mm -hmm. Um, And then another element too is with the uh, cause of having to shut down um, our society in a variety of ways, where are we working? Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. unemployment, um, our communities are not only um, often the first to be unemployed and in crises, economic crises, let alone economic crises that is compacted by or compounded by a health crisis, we're actually also often underemployed, Mm -hmm. meaning we're not getting paid enough in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so um, debts and people um, being much closer to being evicted or not being able to pay their bills, most of us were barely had $400 in savings just on a day-to-day basis, let Mm -hmm. alone to not see a paycheck. So the economic disparities as well as the health disparities have been issues, particularly in our communities. And then they have their own types of relationships being women who are primary caretakers in these situations and so on and so forth. um, That has, again, only the pandemic has only exposed what was already the cracks and the fixtures in our society. Now I'm gonna tell you something as you're talking, Reverend Green, all that right there, that sounds stressful. <laughs> okay, you, I, I feel an, an extra level of stress just you describing all of that because mm-hmm. here you have, if we paint the picture of, of just a, a typical average, let's say black woman in America, Mm-hmm. Okay, in July of 2020, let's just go back a little bit of time. Um, and this person now went from um, living life as normal to three months, then getting sheltered in place, having a fear and a tear of acquiring um, a potentially fatal virus, mm-hmm. right? And having to live within and work within that, maybe being within, confined within the home of somewhere that may or may not be safe, may or may not have full access to things. Um, then also watching people, literally watching people die on a screen um, at the hands of, of unjust, in an unjust way or through police brutality. Um, and, and then you're adding in what you're saying, this economic stress and the socioeconomic stress, that's a lot to manage and to hold. 
Um, and I, I would imagine that that's the experience of so many people. But here's the part that I find truly um, uh, kind of astounding to me, I think is the, is the best word that I can see. Um, because again, COVID-19, this pandemic, the um, increased in notoriety for racial injustice, it's not new, it's exposed, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is something that black and brown folks have been dealing with for many decades. But here's the part that's different in 2020. Now, we can't hug the people we love because of it, mm -mm. right? We're seeing, we're watching these people die. We're having this, um, in psychology, we call it a shared racial fate, right? You see George Floyd on the television, you see Ahmaud Aubrey, you see Breonna Taylor, and you don't just see them, you see your sister, you see your exactly. cousin, you see your brother, you see your children, mm -hmm. right? Then instead of like we had in many decades past in the civil rights movement, for example, where you could huddle together, go over to somebody's house, sit and hold them. Now we're sitting here like, oh, should I get closer than six feet? Mm -hmm. I even go over to my mother's house. Mm -hmm. All right. So it leaves this physical presence of isolation that absolutely is impacting the mind and the soul, right? Which is where we come in as observers of the, of the soul. Right. Because, you know, as you hearken back to um, thinking about the civil rights movement as an example where the um, upheaval was just so right there, right? And in addition to the domestic terrorism um, and the apartheid system of um, the Jim Crow and Jim and Jane Crow, and, and let's be honest, it wasn't just Jim and Jane Crow in the South either. Mm -hmm. um, they also had church, yeah, right? A lot of organizing, a lot of gathering Mm -hmm. um, in relationship to protests, in relationship to um, tending to the personal and the emotional wounds, um, both in terms of that shared racial fate, mm -hmm. as well as just trying to get through um, day to day, folks always could come back for, for whom faith was a deep part of their life right. and come into um, the church. And mm -hmm. not only in that space, uh, were they able to get hugs? Were they able to be affirmed? Were they able to understand, as Jesse Jackson uh, would say, I am somebody, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the Black church, particularly way before James Brown said, say it loud, I'm Black and a proud, the community was saying it to one another. And sure. in that space, not only did you have the gift of the communal and the fellowship of not only believers, but your church family and many of whom were also um, people's uh, kinfolk as well mm -hmm. as skinfolk. Mm -hmm. But also there you received the word. You see, you received the gospel. Mm -hmm. You got to hear Jesus, um, hear the preacher talk about Jesus and the kingdom of God and that God's call for us is to live in a space of justice, to live in a space where uh, we're no longer held captive by oppression. Mm -hmm. um, to be to hear this proclamation in that time and space, um, there's a saying. It's it's not a it's not a scriptural saying, but it's a church colloquial saying um, that God is as close to us as our next breath. We we were, will be in the space of the spirit, you know, in that time, mm -hmm. and uh, we don't have the same immediate access to right. those faith resources. And I and I say it like that because it's not as though we're we're completely um, divorced from engaging. Many congregations sure. have figured out how to do online church. Mm -hmm. Many um, uh, church communities have figured out how to um, tend to the communities in, in untraditional ways mm -hmm. um, because of the social distancing and so on and so forth. But the one thing that, that holds true and doesn't, doesn't fade, right, is the word of God. Yeah. And, and so that I'm glad you bring that up and taken care of and, 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 and discuss um, along the way, whether it's in Bible study or from the pulpit um, right, in, right. in many ways. And some things that we, we, we don't always realize is that and, and what makes the gospel um, so, so important is that when Jesus was preaching, when Jesus was doing his ministry, he was doing his ministry in another type of an apartheid white supremacist system. And that was the Roman Empire. Palestine was um, a conquered nation. Israel was a conquered nation in which Rome ran everything, in which Rome uh, perpetuated the economic injustice, making sure um, in that time period, uh, only about 5% 
of the country had more than subsistence in terms or subsistence in terms of living, meaning they actually could have food for a week and can see it coming. And is in this space in which Jesus is coming in and, and doing this work and having this conversation about the kingdom of God and is pressing on that God wants this justice for us and God is calling us to follow in that path of justice. And that faith is what helps us get through those times, recognizing that trouble doesn't last always. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we in, in this time, not being able to gather in, in our church spaces, not to be able to, to be a part of these um, our communities and hearing the word in person with one another, right, whether two or three are gathered in, in his name, you know, it, it becomes a bit of a challenge. Um, but at the same time, we still have the resources of, of faith and resources of prayer and resource of fellowships in a different kind of way to both buoy us in the time of injustice, as well as providing us with comfort in the time of grief that this pandemic has caused. Absolutely. I think that's, that's really profoundly said, you know, and, and I think this is where our fields can, can complement each other nicely, mm -hmm. because you're talking about, you know, these spiritual ways in which you, things are different right now because of the pandemic, but here's the part where I, I go psychologist on you, okay? Mm -hmm. Because when two or three are gathered, what we know about the bodies that God made is that they're not, it's not good for man to be alone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's not just a spiritual thing, that's a physical thing. Mm -hmm. um, so there are people who job it is solely to touch babies in a NICU when they're by themselves because mm -hmm. physical touch and proximity literally is how our brains wire and continue mm -hmm. to exist so when two or three are gathered in a church house even if they're just right next to you when they hug you mm -hmm. that's nice and kind and sweet but also what they're doing is activating your parasympathetic nervous system mm -hmm. so that you can calm down when you're stressed mm -hmm. that physically helps anybody who's had a weighted blanket or had somebody just hold on to them or squeeze their hand real tight mm -hmm. knows how good that feels mm -hmm. right so when everybody says back up don't touch all right, now we're in a place where we have to self-soothe, mm -hmm. okay? And for a community, when we're talking about the Black community, that's not done the most bang up job of acknowledging <laughs> difficulty and stress and overload anyway, mm -hmm. to leave people to their own devices when we haven't even acknowledged the toll that all this stuff is taking, mm -hmm. that's tough, right? Um, so to have this increase in overload of stress when it's overwhelming, um, what that's going to do to the body is the key. And you said something earlier, you listed some health conditions, mm -hmm. right? That, that are, have disparate rates in the black community, right? Um, where they're higher in those, in those areas. Oddly enough, those are some of the same conditions that are caused by, that are the result of chronic stress. Oddly enough, those same conditions can make one more likely to have a severe experience with COVID-19. So when we're talking about this issue in the Black community, when we're talking about disparate rates and what's this doing and, oh, are people stressed out? It's not because it sounds good. It's because literally this is a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. So not experiencing, not talking about and acknowledging just how much stress we've been under, we as a Black community, could be causing some conditions that are keeping people from literally extending their lifetimes. Right. And that's why we should talk about it. So you and I decided we were going to start with ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we were going to say, you know, over this last year when we've had, what does that look like? What does stress look like, particularly race-related stress in the event of all of this racial injustice? How has that manifested for you personally and professionally? I'll let you go ahead and start. Um, the first thing that really comes, so I'm single. And um, I'm by myself and with my dog, Monk, who is a pit lab mix. And um, so the one thing is that comes to mind, especially in relation to what happened this summer um, with um, the reminder of the toxic, the racist toxicity that we live in. Um, I got super stressed because I'm also an aunt. I have a nephew who's 24. And I have a, a niece who is uh, six years old and not just thinking about my life and what could happen to me 
I immediately go in terms of what's happening, what could happen to them. My nephew is in a graduate school. Um, he is, he has a girlfriend, he's up and down the road on a regular basis. Um, we have seen that, you know, being a woman is not um, covering from experiencing racial and systemic violence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and looking at my, my niece in, in so many ways and, and wanting to protect her in a way that I know that I can't. Mm -hmm. um, the other element is in terms of um, Austin is in many ways has its, its benefits and its wonderful features. And Austin as a person who just moved here, I'm still kind of finding my way is also can be a, a lonely place to be. And one of the things I am um, concerned about constantly um, is contracting the virus, not, not simply because of what it can do to me, but I have no support system here. Mm -hmm. um, and I work at a predominantly white institution where most of my colleagues have known each other and worked with each other for a number of years, um, but I'm not at a place where I can look to them as kind as they are for that kind of support, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that weighs on me because I am extra cautious, not only on a day-to-day, -day, but I also don't want my old, my elderly parents, I feel like they have to come here to take care of me. So as same as folks, even when their uh, family units live in the city, are trying not trying to keep distance and so on and so mm -hmm. forth to keep them healthy and safe. You know, I have a, a, a for me, it's a little bit of an, another conversation um, in terms of making sure I stay safe so mm -hmm. that none of my family who don't live near have to travel across the country to get here sure. to help. But what what you're saying though, I'm not sure the only one, okay? Mm -hmm. um, two things that you brought up that I think are, are prevalent in the black community, but unspoken and unprocessed. First was a sentence where you said, I have no support here. Mm -hmm. That has been thought and spoken in isolation, right? In rooms where no one can hear. There's a realization where I am on my own, mm -hmm. okay? Yes, we all are kind of physically on our own, but like you said, living um, in a predominantly white space when you're one of the onlys, and you're realizing this lack of support also while carrying this second thing you said, which is this increased burden and responsibility for the lives of the people around you. Mm -hmm. That's stressful, mm -hmm. okay? Just because it's normal and it's common does not make it okay and does not make it any less of a toll on the body. Mm -hmm. So when I look at my boys, when I look at my seven-year-old and my three-year-old boys and I look at them and I think, what's the time clock on those kids? How long till they're not so cute anymore? Mm. How long until they look like a threat to somebody else? How long until they're doing nothing except for sleeping or driving or existing with melanin soaked skin mm -hmm. and people won't see them like I see them, mm -hmm. okay? Um, it took me a while and I'm a psychologist and it took me months to realize that's stressful. That's mm -hmm. a lot on me and my heart and my lungs and my body, right? Mm -hmm. To carry that around. One of the most um, brilliant and I think encouraging aspects of the black community is its resiliency, mm -hmm. is the ability for people to carry all that stuff and get up the next day and do it again and do it again and do it again. So right? how do you do it? How do you how do, do it? I don't Dr. know. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a book water. Okay. In terms of your, in terms of your own professional and personal processing, you know, both what are some of the experiences that sure. you're having and with all of your resources, both professional sure. and your, your, um, deep spiritual and faith sure. resources, yeah. how have you been tapping into elements of care, um, for those things in your personal and professional life that has, um, in which the stress of it all has, increase and, and been more impactful than a normal season? Sure. Um, let me think. Two things come to mind, first of all. Um, I, I will, if you don't mind, I'm going to bring up something the last time we spoke. We coined a term that I want to introduce. Mm -hmm. uh, you coined it. You said this thing called runner's anxiety, right? And I'd love to bring that up because I realized that that was such a powerful part of what I um, was living with. Wasn't living with it before May of 2020. 
Mm -hmm. um, and realized it this past summer when my husband went for a jog at, at dusk. It, it was getting dark. It was still light outside, but he decided to go for a run. Kept running. I don't, I'm not a runner. I don't know what you people do. Just running around like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't do that. But he kept running for a while. Was gone longer than expected. And um, it got dark. And I'm walking around the house and I'm thinking, I feel funny. I don't feel quite right. Like I feel, I'm edgy. I feel kind of tense. And I realized, wait, I'm panicking. That's anxiety because I don't think he's coming home. That's what was going on. Um, and you spoke about something similar, right? This kind of anxiety mm -hmm. around running. And because I saw on television with my, here's that shared racial fate, right? right? I saw that all you have to do is go for a jog mm -hmm. and you don't come home when you have black skin. Mm -hmm. All right. And so I internalized that. I wasn't aware of that at the moment, at the time. But once somebody that I cared for in my, where, like you said, when you're responsible for sustaining their life, or at least you feel as such, mm -hmm. then he leaves and I'm thinking, oh man, what do I do? So in, in terms of, of how I care for myself, then honestly, part of the work is acknowledging that I'm panicking because of what just happened, putting mm -hmm. those things together and explicitly stating, hey, this is, this is race related stress. This is me being upset actually naming that and saying that to someone because I think part of the cultural messaging in the black community says that to admit something like that to admit panic worry fear insecurity overwhelm is a real serious weakness oh right right and you're a strong black woman I can't I can't be like that right I gotta keep it going another day uh, when somebody asks me how I am I'm supposed to say those vague random things that don't mean anything you know I'm making it <laughs> right another day mm -hmm. we here keep it on know. keep it on mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. hey i could complain but i won't right right uh, too blessed to be stressed where, too blessed blessed and highly favored stuff where mm -hmm. you're like yeah still have no idea how you're doing right mm -hmm. um and so even just being honest with myself first mm -hmm. but then with a trusted circle of people that was harder for me than i thought um, and if it's harder for me, and I, I do this for a living, okay, I know that it's hard for other people who are not in this particular community. Um, yeah, there's a, um, so as, as Dr. Holman mentioned, I, I'm, I run, and um, Ahmaud Aubrey's case for me was far more theoretical before we learned the name of Ahmaud Aubrey. You know, I, um, I'm, a, I'm a brown woman who's 5'2", who, who has gotten to a place she runs but so fast. And, um, you know, I've, I've been running for almost 20 years. I've always been conscientious of my environment um, and so on and so forth. More so because I just know you're supposed to be careful, right? You know, you're supposed to, you know, stop and look both ways before you cross the street. I pres Praise be to God, never seen anyone get hit by a car crossing the street, but I know I need to stop and look both ways, right? And Ahmaud Aubrey's murder was a reminder to me that, and, and he was just running, minding his own business, doing his thing, um, that yes, Bridget, you're, you're, not, you're not just doing it because you know you should you know, stop and look both ways, but there is this looming threat because of my black body. And especially if I'm walk, I'm running in um, mixed or predominantly white spaces. And it can just be the public park that I have to be a little bit more aware of what's going on um, as, as part of that. Um, and that's real. And, you know, one of the things you, you, you talked about is not only having to um, come to understand for yourself how you feel, but also being in a space to communicate it and communicate it with someone. And, um, you know, there's, there are multiple avenues um, for that. I'm, I'm, I'm my, one of my best support system is I have a cadre of friends and family I talk to on a regular basis. So even though I don't feel like I have a whole lot of support in Austin, I have tons of support um, across the country in terms of family and friends. And one of my friends is actually um, has a degree in counseling psychology. And um, she's not practicing right now. And I don't use her. Oh, my camera went off. 
Um, I don't use her, uh, our, our friendship for her to give me uh, free counseling or anything like that. But what has been fruitful in, in our conversations is she, we will talk about something and she would be able to say, when are you going to make that appointment for a counselor? You need to go ahead and you need to go ahead and do that. And she's not saying that to me because she doesn't want to hear me. As much as she recognizes that I need to be in touch with deeper set of resources and expertise to help me process my trauma, to help me process, you know, my stress, my anxiety, um, and those types of elements. Um, and she is so right. And, um, and she tells me that my, my good friend who's a counselor, um, we, our relationship started in college but our, our relationship was nurtured in the church. So she's one church person of faith who recognizes the, the, the gifts and skills that God has blessed people with and provided them the opportunity for education to go further with to help mm -hmm. us through our, what we're experiencing emotionally, psychologically, sometimes cognitively. I don't know, Dr. Holman, if you might know anything about what I'm talking about by any chance. I mean, I'm just, I, I might theoretically, hypothetically. Hypothetically, you might like know that, a little bit about you know, the psychology thing. I might know, okay. Um, now here's the other, I, I see a question over here. I, I feel like I wanna answer as part of my response to you. It's talking about the historical generational trauma mm -hmm. on black people. Um, and I wanna answer it partly I think the second part I'll save for a little bit, but I want to answer that in terms of the historical trauma. You, you asked about how I care for myself and what I've been doing over the last year. Um, one of, I, I think that the period of African enslavement in this country was horrific and tragic and really um, made some really terrible ripple effects. But one of the greatest ones that I feel um, happened because of that are the narratives that continue to exist about black bodies. There are ideas that we still hold generation to generation that we don't even realize are still perpetuating. Um, and so part of what I think is so powerful and liberating for black folks is to create counter narratives for themselves. When you're talking about the cognitive aspect to, to fight the power, if you will, mm -hmm. um, by simply standing on truth that's counter to those narratives. And one of the things that I like to say to myself is that black bodies were made on purpose and with purpose, okay? And they deserve a full human experience. They just do, that's just true, okay? Um, that's gospel truth, if you wanna say it like that, we all are made in the image of God. And so uh, we can walk in that, um, starting with our own. And so when I say that, that full human experience, I think one of those, those lies around the narratives of, of African enslavement is that black bodies weren't made on purpose with full human experience. They were made um, in a transactional way Mm -hmm. to the service of capitalism and white supremacy. So whatever happens to those bodies, it's really just a means to an end to as long as these other people were serviced, as long as money still was made, as long as the bottom line still happened. Mm -hmm. That's wrong, okay? That's really wrong, but we still perpetuate that with a lot of our interpersonal relationships, um, with the ways that a lot of times black folks find themselves in these um, these interracial relationships where they don't feel like it's reciprocal or fully life-giving, um, where we end up working for people or doing things, putting our own needs on the back burner um, because we are still somehow digesting that idea that we're really not worth paying that much attention to, that our purpose and worth just isn't really there. Um, and sometimes we can even perpetuate that amongst each other which is really problematic. So I think for me, I find the smallest, most feasible ways possible to go ahead and counter that narrative. Sometimes what that looks like is feeding myself nourishing food, moving my body around, like you said, sleeping, because my body was made on purpose to sleep. I sleep as an <laughs> act of worship that I am not divine, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I am mortal and that's great, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so doing things like that, it's allowing relationships to have more distance if they're not reciprocal mm -hmm. and not apologizing for that. 
Um, because I think sometimes there's this idea of loyalty and service and servitude, especially for black women that we can get into and that gets passed down generation to generation. So I think one of those things that's helpful in the face of historical and black trauma is choosing to have the courage and the bravery to counter that narrative with your own life and your own people. Mm -hmm. So one other thing in terms of the the trauma, uh, the trauma that black community has and the, the generational aspect of it, we're we're also facing in relationship to um, our vaccinate our vaccine hesitancy mm -hmm. in terms of not trusting the medical system. Um, the Tuskegee experiment um, mm -hmm. is, is the one that is most commonly known um, where um, for a period for over 50 years in Tuskegee, Alabama, um, basically the U.S. government uh, was, based, was experimenting in not treating um, African-American men and women who uh, may have contracted syphilis. Mm -hmm. And a few that they did, but many that they didn't as a part of a longitudinal study um, to figure out, you know, what are the effects of it? And um, let alone what we know, I can't remember the name of the person, um, but the, the, the doctor who is known to have uh, started the study of obstetrics and mm -hmm. the use of um, enslaved black women right. to experiment on their bodies mm -hmm. in, ter in terms of trying to learn about um, pregnancy and gynecology and mm -hmm. so on and so forth um, and not providing uh, medication for pain as part sure. of it. Um, it's, you, you can't have a, a Tuskegee experiment without having a, a few examples beforehand to say that Absolutely. that was okay. Mm -hmm. And um, folks not, and, and then not only do we have those types of atrocities that are within our, our historical narrative, we have had um, people with, with so many awful experiences with doctors, yes. doctors who didn't listen. You know, that's Absolutely. one of the reasons why one of the growing concerns in black female community um, is um, in childbirth, the more yes. the morbid, mor what is it? The mortality rate, mortality rates. Mm -hmm. um, both in terms of infants as well as mothers giving birth. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is uh, doctors not in, in hospital staff not listening and mm -hmm. therefore not giving good care and not having good care resulting in such awful effects in the family. And so having the vaccine um, for which for all that we understand for now is one of our best resources to combat the mm -hmm. pandemic. The idea for many of us to um, go forward with that, with our mistrust of the, not necessarily the science, the sciences community, a scientific community as much as the medical community because of all the ways in which um, our families have experienced, um, let alone the history of trauma um, that relates to uh, medical care and medical procedure. And just thinking that we can be part of an experiment just like everything and everybody else. And, and, and that's part of that narrative, right? That playlist, Absolutely. you know, that's why we have doctors at um, a Harry in Tennessee and Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta and in various places um, that are really putting their necks out to, to help the, our black communities and brown communities understand that we've been a part of this conversation and we're here to make sure you know, we get what we need as part of this process. So that's another element in, in how we're seeing um, generational trauma um, arise in our communities as we look forward to trying to get past this pandemic. Absolutely, I'm glad you brought up the example. I think it's great, um, great example of both the, the issue and ripple effect of racism mm -hmm. and injustice and systemic inequities, but also another example of unacknowledged stress. Mm -hmm. That's stressful. If you're putting yourself, imagining yourself in a doctor's office about to get shot up with God knows what that's going to do God knows what to you for God knows how long. I'm sorry, what? Right? And people are like, no, it's fine. Just trust me. Okay. But you've been socialized for many years to think, don't trust those people. Um, Tuskegee experiment comes up over and over and over again, right? And so one of the ripple effects I see from African enslavement, one of those narratives is that black bodies are out of control and out of power. Okay, they're not in control and powerless for their own bodies. We can take that back, right? And so I think part of 
the, the hesitancy initially for the vaccine is understandable because of that history, mm -hmm. but it's also a way of, of attempting to maintain control and power over your mm -hmm. body, right? Nobody's going to do that to me. I'm not going to have people put that stuff in me. I don't know what that is, the attempt mm -hmm. of power. And so what I would assert though, is that we could do that in a better, in a, in a more um, helpful way given the condition of our time, that the mm -hmm. world is burning around us. Mm -hmm. um, so what we can do is take back control and agency. What I tell people in my intro psych classes, you know, my goal here is not to make you all psychologists. I know you won't be, but I want you to be critical consumers of information. Exactly. I want you to hear something, critically examine it, have the power and agency to educate yourself on it, mm -hmm. right? Regardless of what other people are saying or doing, that's how we take back control and agency of this, mm -hmm. right? Listen to it, have an open handedness to go into your field. There's wisdom in that, mm -hmm. right? In consideration, in listening and being open handed as opposed to closed minded to hear what's actually going on with this thing. Oh yeah, critical um, thought and reasoning is hugely important in what I do um, because uh, the Bible is, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know to the degree in which you're in eighties kids, but I used to watch transformers cartoon yeah. and their little thing was there's more that meets the eye. Oh, sure. And oftentimes people think they can read scripture and that, um, without having, um, time to really just, just read closely. Mm -hmm. You don't even necessarily have to get a master's degree in doing it, but to learn how to slowly read and to, yes. um, pay attention to the details of What's, what is the story and, and what is the context? What are the people talking about? What is the time and space? Mm -hmm. Because when the first writers um, were putting the scriptures together, the audience already knew, right? It's mm -hmm. us who are having to try to, to sure. find out Put and ourselves. figure yeah. out. Mm -hmm. And then also how to be able to read uh, scripture um, in a way that helps us to understand those elements that are transcendent Mm -hmm. It transcends the thousands of years of culture and so on and so forth. And those elements that we have come to understand really do um, harken back into the, the wisdom and the spirit of God. And we, you mm -hmm. see that through the text, there are themes after, you know, four or 5,000 years of writings and compilations and so on and so forth that constantly run through. Um, and, and, and you have to learn how to um, be, I mean, the scriptures in Deuteronomy talks about um, being, uh, a, being a people who uh, read the commandments and talked about it with their people. Talk mm -hmm. about it with those around you so you can discern Mm -hmm. right? The information and discern how we are to live in community with that information. Mm -hmm. So I think what um, you're saying though, is, is you're speaking to another one of those cultural uh, norms around spirituality, I think uh, in many communities, but we'll stay here with the black community um, because it, what you're saying about this discernment or this critical lens, uh, a lot of people equate with dismissal Right. And just kind of out, out heresy. Yeah. So if I really critically examine those things or really examine scriptures or here's a thought, pair spirituality with therapy, mm -hmm. then somehow or another, I'm, I'm less, I'm not safe, safe, right? Right, right. Um, I'm just like low key safe because right. I had this other thing. I'm not well, really and, trusting God. And the other thing too is oftentimes we reread the scriptures anticipating what it will say versus yeah. slowing down to see what it really says. And, and those are two different things. And, and mm -hmm. in part, because if, if someone preached something over and yeah. over again, or a Bible study, sometimes you we end up imposing what's in there. We say projecting. Over projecting. Here. That's yeah. the <laughs> Projecting. See, this is yes. why we're together, right? That's we have, why. You know, you, you end up projecting what's there. And then when you actually have a person and you teach them how to really slow down in their reading mm -hmm. and in being open to the ways in which the text really does talk about the human experience, the good, mm -hmm. the bad, the ugly, and the shameful, as well as the justice, the great, the honor, and the righteous, mm -hmm. it just puts it in a whole other light. Um, I can talk about this forever. Because mm -hmm. I do, that's why they pay me to teach. But we have a, a few questions on here, so maybe we might need to kind of transition and. Sure. Um, there there is more a question about tackle? the economy, outlook on social financial division within the Black community. Um, uh. Complicated. Um, I 
I think this for the way that I'm reading this and Jerry, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm reading this as a way um, where we can answer this through the lens of intersectionality. Okay, so when we've got um, a, a black community of people, these, these are people that we're all defining with one social identity, just a singular one, right, which is blackness. Um, and, and here, one thing that I've said in past talks, you know, is, is part of giving black folks humanity is understanding the complexity within the community. Mm -hmm. um, so part of that narrative of, that dehumanizes black folks is making them completely monolithic. Mm -hmm. You've seen one, you've seen them all, you talk to one, you talk to them all, right? Um, and so with that, I think understanding how intersectionality manifests and understanding that, that the black community is complex and multifaceted and there's many different areas of, of um, discussion and topic, you know, and financial issues are just one of those. And, and it's unfortunate though, that sometimes what happens in the black community is people start thinking, you know, uh, well, you, you over there now with those people, right? Um, I've seen that division financially. I've seen it educationally mm -hmm. where people can kind of distance themselves um, because of, of who has and who has not. Um, so I think it's unfortunately, I, I would read that question as a call to um, a further understanding of intersectionality, but go ahead, Reverend Green, if you have additional thoughts. I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you on, on that. Um, and I think another element that we've seen in our, our communities before segregation, um, a lot of Black communities were um, heterogeneous socioeconomically because mm -hmm. um, we, we all had to live in the same neighborhood. And so mm -hmm. you could have on the same neighborhood uh, teachers and the, the, a, a physician, and you can have uh, someone who's, who, who works um, in sanitation and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And it, it, there's this kind of we're um, in, in, in that you occupy same spaces like church um, mm -hmm. and you go to church together. And what that affords is a, a bringing together of resources mm -hmm. and a bringing together um, some shared ideas around policies and politics that could help move the community forward. Um, whether you are a person who is poor or working class or middle class. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't really see that as much because we now we live in different areas and so on and so forth and that sense of division um, can feel far greater mm -hmm. um, than it actually is and and how do we come to that and and understanding uh, one of the things I, I deal with and talk about whether it's regarding to white privilege or economic privilege or what have you or even privilege in terms of sexual orientation or gender uh, I, I saw a quote years ago that says use your privilege wisely mm -hmm. And what that means to me is we I mean you we can't because privilege isn't earned. Mm -hmm. It's not like That's you can dispel it when it. it happens, right? Like I'm a man. In terms of me being um, a, a Gen Xer, I am um, going to let go of my privilege of being you know a forty some odd year old person who can do this, that, and the other um, in order to make sure the young people get what have you. Mm -hmm. And the element of it to me is how do we use our privileges to provide the access and provide the resources and open the conversation and spaces so that we all may be able to tap into the resources that we're supposed to be able to, to live and survive and thrive mm -hmm. on. Okay. So those are one of those things that come to mind. There's another question that's come up a couple of times. Um, I don't know if on your screen, but mine, and I'm going to throw this to you as a start is uh, touching on the emotional and physical trauma a lot of black children may face coming up without having a father. All right, listen and, and, here. And, and, as, you, as, you, as you respond to that, Dr. Holman, going mm -hmm. to say, you get this one and we get one more question before we close it Okay, out. so two total. Um, Derek, you just gonna have to sign up for my African-American psychology class because we don't have time, there's five minutes left. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've got a whole unit on it, okay? Um, Oh gosh, it's a lot. So I, I think when we talked about this whole added layer, right, uh, with the pandemic, with this racial injustice of, of just added on to general life, that's one of those things that's added on. Um, I think about fatherless, absent, well, I say missing fathers, because um, absent implies that they're all, that's all by choice. 
um, and even sexual abuse of Black women. I think about stuff like that when we're talking about uh, the other question about historical generational trauma. Um, that stuff can be traumatic. It can leave emotional voids. It can leave kids with kid logic in adult bodies. Mm, mm -hmm. Uh, So I don't, probably all of you that are grown people that can vote and drink and go do whatever, um, you still got logic from when you were eight or 12 or 11 that put back in a certain experience or a certain relationship. It's not cognitively true, but it is emotionally true. And so I think one of the biggest issues that we have when parents are missing, right, because they are so much of how we shape our narrative and our identity of who we are, um, is that we got that kid logic. So whatever it is that you decided was your responsibility in the parent leaving, whatever somebody told you about that, uh, whatever you told yourself, you know, I think that's one of the enduring effects of that, um, especially when it's not dialogued and processed, particularly in a therapeutic context, we just keep that kid logic to ourselves. Um, and those wounds may end up in getting enacted on other people, which I feel like is, is part of that generational trauma somebody else asked about. Uh, for just a moment, I understand uh, Dr. Um, Burnett had a hand up, and I think we've missed it. Dr. Burnett, uh, please come in and, and share your question or your thoughts. Thank you, Reverend Bruja. I didn't have my hand up. Um, I was probably saying amen to something. <laughs> uh, a lot of good points that people made. <laughs> Thank you for seeing that. Okay. Okay. Excellent conversation. Great. Okay. Can I clarify something really quickly, Dr. Brewing? I mean, Reverend Brewington. Sure. One of the things, you know, when I and I talked about the element of um, our diversity um, in terms of uh, financial diversity and SES or what have you and privilege. One of the things that we are gifted, being a part of the Houston Tillerson family, in the, in our in our variety of ways, is education. You know, not everyone is able um, via time, via money, or what have you, to pursue um, college education. And the critical skills that we gain from being in class with one another, with our interactions with our professors, with our readings, and so on and so forth. And, you know, one of the things about that privilege, that privilege that is developed because we were able to in the, in the amount that we've been able to learn, allows us to share that with the community. You know, allows us to have conversation about, as Dr. Holman say, um, not being um, holed up by a narrative regarding uh, the medical knowledge, but how to engage that knowledge for ourselves to make healthy decisions for one another. Mm-hmm. How do we engage in terms of understanding um, just how to vote and how important voting is? And not everyone knows that. Not, 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 under, not everyone understands how those systems work, but through various avenues of our education, we've been able and, and having the privilege and, and it's a hard, I mean, it's not to say that it's been easy for a number mm-hmm. of us to come back to school or to go to school and to make it happen or what have you. But how do we take those resources that we've gained that allowed us to kind of to live in space and a little bit differently than before so that those who weren't able to have that same type of in the classroom knowledge can uh, benefit from what we've been able to learn and to be able to teach it um, to others who aren't in those shared spaces. And so um, I just want to add that in terms of understanding that even this conversation can be a gift, um, especially in terms of the, the hopefully uh, Dr. Holman and I gave a good word um, that people can take with them and um, see their ways to health and see their ways and to understand and recognize what's going on for themselves and take those types of measures they need to care for themselves. And that good news and that understanding, you all who are joining us on this call can hopefully will spread it and be in conversation with your loved ones who weren't able to be here today. Absolutely, very well said, I definitely agree. Uh, How about words from, from, from you, Dr. Holman, closing words? Um, Yeah, I think education is great. (laughs) I love it, co-sign on it. Um, I think part of what I would say in turn, if I go psychology on you, is is getting further in continual education and learning about 
how stress impacts the body and how you can cope well with that. So understanding what stress looks like for you. Um, so for me, particularly, I'll use myself as an example. Um, my, when I get stressed out, I'm not crying a river, but my shoulders are touching my ears. Like, it's fine. Everything's fine. Right. And so uh, what I have to monitor that I have to be aware of that. I have to understand, Hey, that's my body doing a thing. That's fight or flight or freeze response. I need to do something to counteract that and do that. Well, Mm -hmm. right. I need to understand when my hands are like fists, you know, when I'm tense, when I do feel like that weird, I think I'm going to cry feeling, ah, it's fine. Just keep going. Instead of doing that, understanding how that looks so that we can process the way we use it, metabolize that stress so that we put a chink in that hamster wheel of, of disparate health conditions and um, disparate rates of